Issues surrounding equitable and effective social responses to crime and justice have dominated debate throughout the history of organized political systems. Accordingly, each historical era has produced a few exceptional scholars who function to define and analyze those issues in the public forum. Welcome to our series, Criminology, Conversations with the Masters. I'm your host, Robert Muchnick. The purpose of this series is to provide a number of masters of criminology the opportunity to share their experiences and observations with criminology students. Each segment of the series will present an in-depth interview with a distinguished scholar in the field of criminology. These conversations with some of the best minds in the discipline will serve as an oral history for future students. My collaborator and co-host for the series is Dr. R. Paul McCauley. Dr. McCauley, would you please introduce our guest for today? It is with great pleasure to introduce Sir Leon Radsinowitz. He has been described by his former colleagues of the Faculty of Law at Columbia University as the world's most renowned criminologist, a man who has greatly influenced not only academic work but public policy in many countries. Born in Lutz, Poland in 1906, Sir Leon excelled in his studies of history and languages. In 1927, he went to Rome to study under Enrico Ferri. At the age of 22, Sir Leon received his doctorate of law, graduating cum maxima laude. This is especially significant because he taught himself the Italian language. In 1931, Sir Leon joined the faculty of law at the University of Krakow where he obtained his second doctorate. In 1938, Sir Leon came to England as a representative of the Polish government to prepare a report on English penal policy. He was made a fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge in 1947, and received his third LLD from Cambridge University in 1951. We are very fortunate to have with us such a distinguished individual. Sir Leon, welcome. Looking back on your career and the quality and the quantity that you have produced in terms of publications, you obviously could have entered one of many fields. Why did you choose criminology and who are the people who influenced you? May I, before I answer your interesting question, say <clears throat> how happy and indeed honored I am to be with you here. I do have one important hesitation. I don't know why you have selected me as the first one. There are a number of other criminologists much more distinguished than I am. And my feeling is, being a cynic by nature, that you must have felt that I am close to the final exit list and you wanted to catch me before I became completely gaga. Well, let us assume this is part of the bargain and now I shall try to answer your question. Uh, I went to universities which were prestigious in its kind in Europe at the beginning of the century as legal, great legal institutions. Geneva, Paris, Rome, Krakow, there were formidable institutions as far as regards the quality and the amount of teaching of the law that they have imparted to the students. But <clears throat> I liked it very much, but I felt it's a little too narrow. Of course, law is extremely important. I don't know what would we do without the law, but I did feel there are certain phenomena in life which are more wider than law, and indeed that it is important to understand them as, and it is only then that you'll be able to understand the criminal law as such. And I felt that the phenomenon of crime, because of its social and psychological and political and moral aspects, is a subject which goes outside the strict legal curriculum, however important it is. And this is why I started on this. How was I interested in it? Well, by accident, there was a rather an obscure uh, professor of Serb origin. He was not a professor, he was a young, I would say, assistant who was allowed in the Faculty of Law of Geneva, a patrician and rather conservative university, to give a course of lectures. And I was terribly interested by this incongruous course. And I followed it, and this is how I continued. To follow up on that, yes. uh, are there any other people who influenced you? Yes. Of course, a fundamental influence to me, in a very defi definitive way, was Enrico Ferri. 
He was, as you know, the greatest master, I will say, of the 20th century. He was a collaborator of Lombroso and of Garofalo, and they started the first school, the School of Criminology. Really, this was the first coherent school of criminology. And I was captivated by this man. I read his stuff, or so some of his stuff was translated into French, and therefore I felt I ought to proceed from Geneva, from Paris and Geneva to Rome, and I worked under him in close association. He was extremely nice to me. He always insisted when he invited me to his beautiful palace that it doesn't matter to him what I kind of criminologist I become, providing that I know how to eat spaghetti. And he tried to teach me how to do it, but he was not very successful. But he had a definite and deep influence on me, although later on I have become critical of him, but that's another aspect of the problem. The other professors, I will say, Professor Logos, L-E-L-O-G-O-Z from Switzerland, who became then in justice of the Supreme Court of Switzerland. He was not of the caliber of, uh, of Enrico Ferri, but he was very distinguished, very able, belonging, you know, to the middle stream of reform. Enrico Ferri was a radical of European criminology for a very long time. He is now regarded as a reactionary by the younger people. But this is now another subject which I'm sure will be included in your questions. Yeah, well, we will get to that later. On your way to Rome to study under Ferry, yeah. you had a particularly interesting experience yeah. I'd like you to share with us. Uh, you were accosted and you were actually shot by uh, yes. an attacker. Uh, that attacker was then placed in a mental institution. How did that affect, how did that experience affect your attitude about crime and the criminal justice system? And also, uh, a number of years after, you went and visited him. What were the circumstances that caused you to do this? Well, <clears throat> I'm sorry to disappoint you. My question will be very prosaic in contrast with your deep psychological, almost psychoanalytical inquiry into my primitive soul. I was rather, I didn't think about the fact that it has on me at all. I rather was lucky that I escaped it that I could survive it, because it's a very narrow thing. He tried to shoot me here, the bullet went to my left hand, and therefore this is what most interesting to me. But it was a strange coincidence. Enrico Ferri, who was an Italian extremely eloquent, he said when he saw me when I arrived in Rome bleeding, that you, Leone, he says, one day you'll become a very distinguished criminologist. So I said to Maestro, how do you know it? Well, he said, because already at this early stage of your future specialization, you paid with your own blood for it. <laughs> Why did I go and see him? Again, nothing psychological. I just wanted to know, as he was, he was a man who suffer for, suffered from many of persecution. And I looked at him as he was passing in the street. I was having breakfast in a cafe in Vienna on my way to Rome. And he himself came to uh, Vienna only 48 hours earlier. His name was Wagner. His revolver was extraordinary, primitive. And I was fascinated by him as a young man. And I therefore thought it would be interesting for me to see how is he doing. So I visited him a few years later. And I'm sorry to confess to you that when I arrived, he did recognize me. And he says that he is sorry not to have killed me. Well, this is not the kind of welcome that I expected. On the other hand, maybe this is the kind of welcome that you should expect from a man who is abnormally uh, disturbed. Okay. It was a colorful episode, but I'm glad that I can talk about it and not to be the final victim of it. How would you describe or characterize the evolution of Red Sinowitz's criminology yeah. from your early training in Italy to yeah. today? Yeah. Well, you know, I am a little hesitant to answer this question because it's speaking about myself. Other people ought to do it, and I'm sure they will do it better. But if I keep to objective terms, I would say that <clears throat> I cease to be a positivist. When I worked on, with, uh, under Nico Ferri, and later on, next few years, when I lectured, lectured in Geneva, when I examined the penal system of Belgium and various other things before I settled in Cambridge, I was still an ardent positivist. What has happened to me is that I ceased to be a positivist in the sense that I believe that positivism has rendered a great amount to criminology, fundamental and permanent contribution, but the creed, the philosophy of it, the penological conclusions in the course of my life I have rejected. The second point is that I put a greater emphasis on my historical work. I, I, I have been greatly influenced, you know, by a saying of a dear old friend of mine, Sir Lionel Fox, who said, 
quoted a French saying, rien ne nouveau que ce qu'on a oublié. There is nothing new but what you have forgotten. And I think there is a lot of wisdom in it. And I started to examine the historical aspects of criminal law. Next thing is that as a young man, I was not involved in, in the work of building up criminology, but I had to devote later on a lot of my time when I was asked to establish the Institute of Criminology, the first of its kind, and when I became the <coughs> first professor of criminology. Therefore, the building up of the Institute, not in, close, not in the narrow administrative way, but to find the people, to help to evolve the program, a postgraduate teaching, undergraduate teaching, conferences, special fellowships, lectures in a conservative faculty like Cambridge, and our subject was not made compulsory. I refused it to have compulsory. I believe in competition. It was left optional subject. It's still left today optional subject. And more than half of the students, of law students, take it, in addition to others. So this was another aspect. And then came the third aspect was, the third aspect was advisor to the government as a member of the Royal Commission on Capital Punishment, on penal system, advising the Home Secretary for a quarter of a century. Those kind of things also captured my imagination, and this was the third dimension, to use an American word, to my activity. And last was the comparative, the international. As you know, I was the first head of the United Nations section to deal with problems of crime. I was the first chairman of the Criminological Council of the Council of Europe and there were many other activities, international activities, that I have undertaken uh, because I felt that they extend the dimension of criminology. My main purpose when I did those things was to interest younger people in it. Nothing gives me greater pleasure today, when I am not a young man anymore, to see the young people in England and all over the world who will say old Raji is not necessary anymore. There is a crop of younger criminologists all over the world who may be very critical of me, and they are, but who are there. And this just gives me a great compensation, because don't think that the work that I had to do in those days was an easy one. In your career, you've indicated you have been criticized. You've also received a, a number of accolades over the years. How would you evaluate your impact on the field of criminology? I can only mention two or three objective facts. That when I was asked to establish the Institute of Criminology, and became the first professor. Criminology was in a bad state in England. There was Greenhood in Oxford, there was Mannheim in London, Greenhood died, Mannheim died, there was virtually nobody then. There was a great skepticism about criminology as a discipline in England. It's an empirical approach, there were great skepticism about sociology. You can imagine how great it must have been in relation to criminology. Now, to have University of Cambridge, a conservative, solid university, with its world reputation, to see it acknowledge that they want to have criminology as a subject, that they want to have a professorship, indeed that they want to have a fully developed institute of criminology, had a decisive influence on the development of criminology in England at this critical stage, very much so. There is no question about it. Secondly, I will say, the second is the Cambridge series that we started. As you know, we published 52 volumes. This gave a scope to a great number of people to write. There was no censorship. There was no control. The agreements were signed between the author and the publisher. The honorarium was drawn by them. I never, never corrected the contents. I allowed them to do it whatever they liked. And this was, for instance, a second important, I will say, development. In international work, I fought for bringing younger people into Strasbourg, into the United States, and I fought for integrity and honesty international affairs. So historical studies are regarded as rather important because there was a f one of the earliest attempts to examine the history of English criminal law in the broader social and political context. And I'm delighted to see now a revival of historical studies in the United States, in England, in Canada, younger people taking up the subject, criticizing very often my history, this doesn't matter, but producing very good and important stuff. And I'm delighted to have been associated with it in a modest way. Okay. Could you tell us what kind of work you're currently engaged in? And also, could you share with us what your dreams are for the future of criminology? What is the second part of your question? All right, let me repeat that for you. Uh, could you tell us what kind of work 
you're currently engaged in, yeah. and also what your dreams are for the future. Well, I would say like this, that I feel that you are real with all your kindness, you are cruel to me. You should not ask a man who is 78 years, who worked very hard in life, what is, what is he doing again? You ought to say, Sir Leon, you deserved a villa on the Riviera, you deserve caviar, you deserve champagne, and not to ask me, are you still scribbling? The second part of the question I must also oppose. People at my age don't have dreams anymore, they have nightmares at no dreams. But putting aside <laughs> my flippant attitude, which I'm glad to say will be recorded for posterity, <laughs> I, am, I was engaged in the last uh, seven years, six years, to finish volume five of my history of English criminal law. I was very fortunate to have a collaborator, Roger Hood, whom I regard as one of my ablest students, who was, uh, he went to Cambridge there, uh, he studied in the London School of Economics and in Durham, and he went then to, uh, he came to Cambridge, he studied under uh, me and my colleagues in the Institute, and uh, together we produced Volume 5. Volume 5 is the last volume, I'm glad to say. It covers the last period, between 1850 and 1912, the Victorian and Edwardian period. I envisaged this history when I was a young man, when I came to England for the first time, many, many years ago. This will be Volume 5, and this will be the end of the story. I don't wish to be engaged in work of this magnitude and scope longer. Let other people continue. And also the, pe the present period is too close and I was too close to it. And therefore I leave it with great satisfaction. I don't deny that my history has many defects and limitations, but it is there. And I would like to see other people who criticize the history to produce a similar history of five volumes and allow me to criticize them. But maybe this is expect, expecting too much. Now concerning the dream and the nightmares, I really have nothing. Only my own, my now dream would be, and it's a pleasant dream, is to make new friendships. And this you have given me a chance to do. This is my dream, to meet other people, younger people, to talk to them in a very informal kind of way, to remember the old ones, but one remembers them with increasing sadness because they are really on the exit list and they pass away with increasing rapidity. But I would like to see this. I would like from time to time to make a statement about the critical, the critical juncture of criminology. So it means from time to time a reassessment of the situation, but nothing of a heavy, systematic kind of way. Since you're not excited about talking about the future, let's talk about the past. No. What, uh, what are the great mistakes of criminology in the past? What do you see as our oh, yeah. blunders? Yes, but is the discipline conscious of making mistakes? I doubt it. When they develop and forge and open new horizons, do they think about mistakes? They think that they have the key to all solutions. Did Freud think about that he may be making mistakes in psychoanalysis? Did Karl Marx, old Karl Marx, think that he will ever had a flow in his, in his capital or in his projection of the idealistic state of society without the state? When new disciplines are established, did Durkheim ever had feelings that mistakes were in his system? It's extremely difficult to put pin it down. You can do it only from a perspective of time. Well, I would say one mistake. But again, I can't call it a mistake. I must call it a phenomenon, it's a pity that has taken place. But it was inevitable to take place. It was too much emphasis was put on the differences of school. The school conflict, the classical school, the Marxist school, the sociological school, the, United, the Union Internationale school, the splitting into the schools and fighting with each other and losing a lot of time because they really had not much to say. If they would concentrate more on the object of criminology, it would have been much better. But obviously, I suppose, it was inevitable. I'm glad to see now there is less of a conflict. The classicists and the positivist, or take here, for instance, the determinist and the individualist, the sociologist, and, and those who believe in the hereditary elements, they still have differences, but they are not ranged against each other, like criminology was for 50 years. The second thing, which we still make in criminology, we, are, we repeat, we sometimes make too obvious discoveries. There's too much simple things that is being stated in criminology and regarded as something which is of great importance. 
Third, I think it's still published too much. You may say that coming from a man who produced five volumes and other things, it is rather a selfish remark, but I doubt it. It's too much, too quickly, people write and feel that they must write because otherwise they can't advance in their academic career. I believe that you have to write, but I don't believe that quick writing, inflation writing, is the kind of thing that should be recognized, encouraged. There is still too much, was too much of it, and still there is too much of it. This is another thing. Next point, allow me to say so. And I, when I say this, I apply it to myself too, not only to my colleagues, is the writing, the way that we write. We need simplicity of writing. We must attach importance to form, to presentation. After all, the great masters, if you would read Enrico Ferri in Italian, if you would read Tart in French, if you would read Durkheim, if you would read Weber, it is beautifully written. I don't say that we can write as well as they do. I would say those are the main factors which I believe were undesirable. Some of them are receding, some of them are still there. But remember, dear friend, criminology was established only 150 years ago. If you think about it, if I were to think about a course of criminology that I were to prepare 40 years ago, or that I say when I started, 25, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and today, there will be no comparison. There will be the comparison which exists between, a, a, between first car and Rolls Royce. The amount of materials that criminology has established and collected and is collecting in various aspects, the amount of horizons that they've opened is quite remarkable. And there is nothing to be ashamed of at all. And maybe that our early precursors you are great sociologists, criminologists of the 19th century, or Enrico Ferri including, and others, promised too much. Because they believed so much. They promised so much. Maybe this was enough. But this is the strength of a new discipline. You can't start a new discipline in a critical way, like a chartered accountant who is brought in to, to, to establish the budget of a company which is getting bankrupt. Well, he has to be critical. He has to be pedantic. He has to be suspicious, but if you establish a new discipline and you like to teach to the younger people the thing, you have to be enthusiastic and you have to promise more that you can discharge. Sir Leon, yeah. I'd like to get your reaction to a quote from Tard that he, uh, he made almost a hundred years ago. Tard said, if the tree of crime, with all its roots and rootlets, could ever be torn out of our society, it would leave a vast abyss. Now, you've previously indicated that you believe this to be true. Could you please explain your position and why you agree? Well, <clears throat> as you know, Tart was a very sophisticated Frenchman, brilliant as a writer. He started as a judge. He became the head of criminal statistics, French. He finished as a professor of Collège de France. And he had this paradoxical bent of mind, which appeals to me very much. It is, in some ways, a paradoxical remark. But when you look deeply in it, you see there is a lot of depth. Because this reminds me, one day, Bertrand Russell, who was a fellow of my college, he rang me up and asked me whether I proposed to dine this evening. I said, yes. So come and let us dine together. So we went there, and as we were standing with the great maestro, there was a young fellow of the college who wanted to show how clever he is. So he said, Bertie, what do you think about Ten Commandments? And Russell looked at him and said, Ten Commandments? I will regard them as examination questions and I will try no more than three. <laughs> now, this is really fundamentally the thing. The element of, <clears throat> certainly, of greed, of ambition, of meanness, of duplicity, of all those kind of things are also part of human nature. There's no question about it. We are very mixed animals. In addition to great qualities that we have, we also have the other things. Now, the other things, objectively speaking, are wrong. But when they are put into the fabric of society, they produce productive things. I mean, greed may produce a competitive <coughs> society, which consumer society, which will produce good. Ambition, again, may produce enormous kind of things which are valuable. <clears throat> now, crime is part of our human nature in some ways. <clears throat> like the three questions, I believe there will always be crime. 
because it's part of our human nature. And therefore, if you eliminate which is part of us, you will produce something which is a vacuum. And a vacuum in society is not a healthy thing. It will have to be replaced by something else. <clears throat> but it can't stand. If you have a society with a lot of crime, it's bad. But if you have a society, you are telling me that we have a society which has no crime, it makes me very uneasy. Because I would believe, if there's such a thing, that there is no initiative there, there is no ambition there, that's a vacuum, a sleeping kind of thing, like Eskimos who spend six months a year sleeping. This does not recommend my life. And this is what he had in mind by it. That in this respect, crime produ is a product of certain features which are essential to progress. Sometimes they are directly positive, like political crime. And I mean, Durkheim said it, and Enrico Ferri said very often, although we don't like it, particularly we don't like the violent forms of political crime, but political crime in the long run has produced many changes in society, without which there would be no uh, progress. <clears throat> and thus we can go along and seeing this. I mean, obviously kill, killing <coughs> your wife or mistress, if, uh, faceless to you, is bad. But on the other hand, it means that you can have strong feelings of attachment and loyalty. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. So if you eliminate something in society which is so fundamental and so widely spread, you deprive society of certain vitality. This is what is meant by it. We have heard often yes. that we do not need more laws, no. but simply a more precise and an improved administration of the ones we have. And in 1972, for example, you addressed this question partially in your paper, The Criminal Law Explosion, Can It Be Controlled? Yes. Would you share with us your comments, and incidentally, what do you mean by the expression, the dark figure yes. of crime? <clears throat> this is a crime <clears throat> which is committed, but which finally does not lead to a conviction. This is a broad definition. Now, it can be not this can happen because that sometimes you didn't notice that crime was committed. Like, I, my pocket is emptied when I walk, I didn't even notice that it was stolen. This kind of stuff. But there's not much of it. Crime is committed and is reported to the police, but it's very, police feels that there's little that they can do about it, and as they are overcharged, they have to concentrate their efforts on other serious crimes. So it stops. Crime is reported by the police, but they cannot find the necessary guilt for the fa to bring home the crime to the offenders. And crime finally is the acquitted in the courts because either the courts are a little weak or because it happens through pre bargaining or because again there was not enough proof. And therefore the discrepancy between real crime and committed crime is the dark figure. Now how big is the dark figure? There are differences of opinion. It varies. Estimates vary. I owe my estimate, which has been contradicted by some, but they didn't they contradicted it, but they didn't give me evidence. I believe that what we know about crime, which is recorded and lead to conviction, represents no more than ten percent of the actual crime. I don't believe that this applies to all kinds of crimes. I believe that the ratio on homicide in murder of dark figure is much lower. I believe that 70%, I think, of homicide will lead to conviction. But in rape, I don't believe that more than 30%. Small thefts, one millions which are not, never come to justice. It varies according to offenses. But if I take the total figure, this is what it is. Now, the dark figure produces chances of impunity. The bigger is the dark figure, the more convinced criminals are that they commit crime and not be punished. I believe that the dark figure, first of all, amounts to about 90%. Secondly, that the dark figure increases more rapidly than the recorded crime. There is more and more crime which remains unpunished than crime which is being punished. And the dark figure of crime, as I say, has a great effect on the deterrent value of punishment. Because more dark figures there is, the greater are this belief of people in the deterrent effect of punishment. Because if punishment operates only in 10% of cases, what is its deterrent value? 
There will always be a dark figure in crime. And I would say, like Todd said here, it's a good thing. I shudder to think what would happen if all crimes that is committed would be reported. I really shudder to think. The intolerance that it would breed, the pressure that it would produce, it would be terrific. But to have recorded crime constituted only a minority, because even if they disregard my figure of 90, even if they say it's 50 percent, it's still enormous. It's enormous. <clears throat> and, and, and this continues. Plea bargaining is one of the elements that also produces dark figure. Because under the plea bargaining, remember, my distinguished friend, under the plea bargaining, the offender is punished. But he is punished for less than he committed. So therefore, there is a qualitative reduction in his crime. So it is also a dark figure what comes. And more law will have... What? And more laws will have no... <clears throat> and not laws. It is the catching of the offenders and bringing them to justice which will make a difference, but not the laws. The laws are there. We have plenty of laws. We have enough of laws, really. Looking more into the future, what do you see as the greatest challenge facing criminology? Well, I would say that the challenge is very great because we are passing through a crisis of criminal justice all over the world. Criminal justice, let us be quite frank, is in a bad state. If you look at the world at large, what kind of criminal justice is there in China today? What kind of criminal justice in Soviet Russia? What kind of criminal justice in the Soviet bloc? What kind of criminal justice in the third world? I will say that out of the how many, four billions, I don't know, to remember the, the total population, there may be no more than 10 or 12 countries which have a decent system of criminal justice, and it is not perfect. There will be five or six countries in Europe. There will be part of the United States, not the whole. There will be Canada in U and maybe two or three others. Generally speaking, it is a face of an authoritarian, it's an authoritarian face of criminal justice, where people don't wish to have independent criminological research, where there is a danger that those who rule those countries would like to have a criminology to satisfy their policy, which is a political ideology and not a professional criminology. And therefore, I would say that, and they control the grants for research. And I would say that the great challenge of the younger criminologists is to preserve the integrity and the independence of criminology in face of an adverse political ideology. And I very much hope that the younger people will show the same stubbornness as we did. Enrico Ferri, one of the greatest minds, not only as a criminologist, but as a mind, had to wait 25 years before he became a professor in Rome. I don't wish to speak to you about up and downs in Cambridge, but we, we all the people, we did not have an easy life at all. And I, I hope that the younger people will show this independence, integrity, in face of great difficulties. Because I do not believe that the prospects of first-class system of criminal justice today in preponderant, preponderantly accepted in the world at large, are very high. And I not say this because I'm an old man and pessimistic, because I'm very optimistic by nature, but simply looking at the map as I look at it, and having traveled extensively and observed and receiving confidential and other documents, I have reached the conclusion to which I mentioned to you that criminology in quality is doing much better than criminal justice. Any closing comments? Any closing thoughts? Well, clo closing, my closing comments will be very simple. First of all, I would like to say now what I did say to you in my telephone conversations in my letter. I congratulate you on the scheme. I think that it is a wonderful scheme. Not because, as you must have noticed, I have a critical attitude towards criminology and I don't have a megalomania. I am rather critical. But I believe that it is a fine, noble discipline which satisfies a natural need in society and there will always be crime and there will always be criminal law, and there will always be criminology. And therefore, to record the developments of thought in this field, in this natural kind of way, as you do, is making a very important contribution to the discipline as such. And I know from my friends how very much they value, for instance, the American heritage in the field of history, etc. No one is disappointed. I am not saying that the criminology monument is as big as a historical. How should it be? It couldn't be but it is of sufficient social significance and sufficient scientific substance to be recorded in this kind of way. And I hope, indeed I'm sure, that all the other ones who will succeed me will be much better than I am. And I wish you good luck in your project. Thank you. 
This series is intended to serve a broad spectrum of the criminology community, including academics and professional practitioners. It is our sincere hope that presentations of this sort will contribute positively to our goal of realizing social justice in our complex and changing world. Toward this end, your comments, criticisms, and support are invited and appreciated. It must be remembered that a substantial, though not always productive, element of social debate has focused on disagreement over what was really meant by such historical giants as Durkheim, Marx, and Weber. It is only through the development of technology that oral histories such as this can capture directly the thoughts, words, and positions of the masters. This is Robert Muchnick thanking you for joining us. Issues surrounding equitable and effective social responses to crime and justice have dominated debate throughout the history of organized political systems. Accordingly, each historical era has produced a few exceptional scholars who function to define and analyze those issues in the public forum. Welcome to our series. Criminology, Conversations with the Masters. I'm your host, Robert Muchnick. The purpose of this series is to provide a number of Masters of Criminology the opportunity to share their experiences and observations with criminology students. Each segment of this series will present an in-depth interview with a distinguished scholar in the field of criminology. These conversations with some of the best minds in the discipline will serve as an oral history for future students. My collaborator and co-host for the series is Dr. R. Paul McCauley. Dr. McCauley, would you please introduce our guest for today? It is with great pleasure to introduce Sir Leon Radsinowitz. He has been described by his former colleagues of the Faculty of Law at Columbia University as the world's most renowned criminologist, a man who has greatly influenced not only academic work but public policy in many countries. Born in Lutz, Poland in 1906, Sir Leon excelled in his studies of history and languages. In 1927, he went to Rome to study under Enrico Ferri. At the age of 22, Sir Leon received his doctorate of law, graduating cum maxima laude. This is especially <coughs> significant because he taught himself the Italian language. In 1931, Sir Leon joined the faculty of law at the University of Krakow where he obtained his second doctorate. In 1938, Sir Leon came to England as a representative of the Polish government to prepare a report on English penal policy. He was made a fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge in 1947, and received his third LLD from Cambridge University in 1951. We are very fortunate to have with us such a distinguished individual. Sir Leon, welcome. At one point in your career, Sir Leon, I think 1949, 1950, oh, really? you served on the British Royal Commission on Capital Punishment. Yes. And your work helped to influence decisions made in England and Wales regarding capital punishment. What I'd like to know is, reflecting on your previous work in yes. this area, yes. and your current knowledge of the use of capital punishment in the United States, is capital punishment really a deterrent? Uh, or if it's not really effective, what should we be doing? Yeah. <clears throat> 
You are perfectly right. I was a member of the Royal Commission on Capital Punishment. We worked very hard, seven years on it. We made comparative studies outside England, all over the world. I think it's not for me to say so, but it is a general opinion, even today, that it is the most authoritative, even today, statement about the subject of capital punishment, objective and impartial. I did have also some other experience. I was Senator Hart, uh, one, had a bill to abolish capital punishment in your country, and they brought me there to Washington to express an opinion. On many occasions, I examined uh, the state of capital punishment in various countries. So I have, suppose I know a little about it. Now, you ask me, <coughs> what, what are my views about capital punishment? Now, I disagree <coughs> with many of my colleagues. A great number of my colleagues say that capital punishment is not a deterrent or that it cannot be proved. Well, my friends, there are a great number of things which cannot be proved in the world, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist. I said once, when I was asked what I think about criminal statistics, I said that criminal statistics are like a uh, bikini. What they reveal is suggestive, and what they hide is vital. Criminal <laughs> statistics can be very misleading indeed. And the fact that you cannot prove by criminal statistics doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. What you can say is, in my opinion, that the value of deterrence in relation to capital punishment cannot be accepted as an all-embracing phenomenon. It depends on capital punishment, on the crime committed. Voltaire said that if one of us had an aunt in Cairo, in Egypt, and knows that to press a button in the study, I quoted it, once. She will die, and if she dies, we shall inherit as money. Wicked Voltaire said, who of us will not press a button? Now, I try to correct Voltaire, and I will say, there is a number of people who not only will press a button, but they will take the first plane to go where the really the old woman is dead. And there are the rascals, the, hope, the dark rascals of humanity. There is another group on the left who are, will never commit Murder never killed for any kind of temptation. Calls them the saints, the very virtuous. But in between the two, there is a group, us mortals, which hesitate. And then I would say that capital punishment will be a deterrent. Why? Because although statistics cannot prove it, there is nothing more that people value than life. If people would not have valued life so, so dearly, there would be much more suicide. Look the amount of people who don't commit suicide when they are facing a terminal disease. Look the amount of people who don't commit suicide when they live in terrible miseries that I have seen in India or any other parts of the world. This instinct is a fundamental instinct. And I cannot believe, whatever the statisticians tell me, one way or another, that deterrence would not be affected. However, on conditions that capital punishment is applied in a consistent way. It means it's like whiskey. You have a little whiskey. You may have a little water, but if you have so little whiskey and put so much water, it ceases to be whiskey. If you make an, ex if you make an exception for women, if you make an exception for young offenders, if you make an exception for mentally disturbed people, if you make an exception for political offenders, who remains? You have, then, if you have capital punishment, it must be a whiskey business. It must be applied consistently and, and, and on a very large scale. Is this society? in a state to have a good capital punishment whiskey consistently for many years, irrespective of the social, political, ethical con conflicts that it would produce. I say no, it wouldn't. And the best proof is that you have 1,000 or 500 people waiting for capital punishment. How is it that the United States takes for six weeks to produce a building of 75 floors, and it takes them years and years to execute a, a, a few hundred people who are really have been found guilty of crime? It is because there is a division in op opinion in society. And if there is a division of opinion in society, capital punishment is too serious a matter to be used. And for these reasons, but I am against capital punishment. But I deny that it is not a deterrent. And it is a deterrent in Soviet Russia, and it is a deterrent in other places in China, because uh, it was seriously used. Capital punishment is too serious a matter to be used lightly. And I am against it, not only on penological reasons, because it will be very difficult to produce all discriminations, but also on political and social reasons. When you were in the Department of Criminal Science at Cambridge University, yes. you were quoted as having said, yes. Cambridge was more frightened of criminologists yes. than criminals. What did you mean by this? Well, it is one of my flippant remarks, you know, 
I don't believe that I shall be remembered in history by my profound thoughts, but possibly some of you will remember my flippant thoughts. I have one or two others that I'd like to share with you at the end of this conversation. I, but what I meant by it is that the suspicion of criminologists in Cambridge in those days was so very great that they were put up with the criminal more easily than with the criminologist. When we had to establish the department of, for instance, to give you an example, when I was put forward for an appointment as an assistant director of research, I was rejected once, maybe twice, and not because they didn't wish to have me. They wanted me to be and to do my subject of the history of English criminal law and penal policy, but not to have criminology or criminal discipline. It was too vague. It was too imprecise. They felt that it would be too, how shall I say, influenced by political, you know, upheavals and ups and downs. There was this suspicion. And also because we wanted to have it as part of the law school. And the law school in Cambridge, like all law schools, but Cambridge more, has been and still is a predominantly conservative thing. And that we have our allies, enormous, and the thing has passed through. And the Institute is part of the Faculty of Law. And the Wilson Professor of Criminology is an ex officio member of the Faculty of Law. Conditions have changed. But, but in those days, criminology was regarded with some suspicion. And I must say that I understand it, up to a point. You speak about the positive school. And we know that the positive school had, for a while, at least a very strong foothold on the continent. Why, when we look at the conflict approach here in the United States, why is the conflict approach to criminology not enjoyed the same kind of acceptance or reception that the positive school enjoyed in Europe? Well, because I would say that the positivist school was intellectually much more interesting, much more inspiring than the conflict. You, you, you remember in 1818, 1900 when Ferry produced his book, Criminal Sociology, Lombroso, Delinquent on criminal men, Garofalo criminology, they pushed the whole discipline on a very wide, in a very wide perspective. They did say that crime is also often the product of the capitalistic system of classes, but they didn't make it into one theory. They brought many other aspects in it and enlightened it by historical knowledge, statistical knowledge, psychological knowledge. It was a rich group of people, intellectually rich and stimulating. Now, the conflict Authorities, forgive me for saying so, are bomb balls. They are boring. They repeat the same thing all over again, and what they say is really complete commonplace. If you take, for instance, say the conflict, the criminologists of the Marxist bent, they often say, like Quinny, what is his name? Quinny. Yes, a number of them say that crime is a product of the capitalistic society. Yes and no. Crime is, generally speaking, the product of any kind of society. If we don't have a capitalistic society, you will have another society, and the society will have its own crime, in quality and quantity. Feudal society had its own crime. And I suppose a social society, if there is one, will have its own crime. So there is a certain amount of crime which is part of the society, but there is a certain part of crime which is accepted as crime by the whole society with some slight difference. The difference is in relation to political crime. But political crime is a very relative thing to an Irishman, to call, <coughs> who believes <coughs> in what they are doing now, for instance. If you consider them political criminals, they will reject it this way. They will regard it as an offense. They will say they are liberators. We don't discuss political crime. We discuss the ordinary crime against property, against a person. All workers are against mugging. There's no one worker who is in favor of it. In relation to some other offenses, all of them are against drugs, much more than we are. They are much more, <coughs> they are against, well, against, they are very conservative in the approach, although they live in a capitalistic society. So this conflict theory emphasizes one element, but emphasizes in the way that it tries to show that it is the key to the whole edifice. And it isn't. And it is being repetitive, and in my opinion, Boring. It's the same thing like the deviancy theory. The deviancy theory. Well, of course there are deviants. Maybe some criminologists are deviants, do. But where does it lead us? Bulk of criminals are like all of us with our defects. 
And therefore, I would say that those modern theorists, I would say the same thing with respect to Sutherland, his differential association. I mean, how far does it lead us? <coughs> it shows what? That some crime activities, he would demand, are acquired. That's true, like evidence against is acquired. But he doesn't say that how is it happens that in the same neighborhood some people acquire the criminal pattern and some people don't. Why is it that some people are more sensitive to imitation than others? What I mean by it is that all these theories are useful as if you accept them <coughs> with the proviso, since they don't give the whole explanation, since they just throw light on the phenomenon of crime of a limited nature. And to draw from that general conclusions and regard this as a main explanation of crime is not scientific. It's just your own hobby. This is all what it is. <coughs> Let's pursue the American justice system for yes. a moment then. Do you sus subscribe to the notion that the criminal justice system is both the cause and effect of crime? What uh, another way of saying that would be, do you think the United States has outgrown its system of justice yeah. to the point that the justice system is contributing is a contributing factor to crime? Yeah. Well, the first point is that we know it, all of us know, that the system of criminal justice may produce crime. I believe <coughs> that the system of criminal justice of the United States is grossly underdeveloped. There are <coughs> several reasons for it. One reason is, well, as the United States has shown, <coughs> that so many different nationalities can be brought together and produce the strongest nation in the world without losing their ethnic individuality, that the United States can produce technically all the kind of miracles that they did, why should it not solve the problem of crime? The problem of crime is really, would they say, they said so, is really unimportant. And if they didn't think so, they felt so. In relation to all those things, bring a new nation, start priority, technological priority in spite of things. And therefore there was an optimism that crime will almost dissolve itself with more social welfare policy, with more social strengthening, there will be less and less of it. There was this optimism. The sociologists felt strongly, as they played a role here, that crime can be eradicated as a mass phenomenon, not entirely, but very largely, through a social welfare policy. So this was another point <coughs> which brought this negligence <coughs> of the system of criminal justice. Next was that it has never been given a very high priority. Whereas the demographic and social United States structure has changed, the system of criminal justice stopped to be readjusted. But very little has been done in proportion to the increase of the country population, urban agglomerations, competitiveness of society that it remains a neglected sphere. The system of criminal justice in the United States is in a very bad shape. Take pre-bargaining. When pre-bargaining was all introduced, it was never intended to be a measure which is applied in 90% of cases, as it is today in big cities. It was regarded as an exception measure. Today, it is 90%. Why? Because otherwise the courts couldn't function. But plea bargaining practice on such a scale weakens the deterrent element of, of, of punishment, uh, produces an uh, undignified attitude. It's like buying a carpet in India. You, bar you bargain on both sides, or it is not a solution. <coughs> the top prison federal are quite all right, but the little prisons, the jails, which are hundreds of thousands, they are at the level of John Howard. You know it very well. <coughs> Probation, understaffed, too many cases for supervision. Uh, parole very often is parole appointments too often are made for political consideration as part of the patronage. Capital punishment is in a complete mess. 
There are about 1,500 people sentenced to death, yes, and nothing is going to happen to them, or nothing is happening to them. But from time to time, in an erratic way, somebody is executed. This is not the way when you have capital punishment to deal with it. The aftercare is not very developed. Alternatives to punishment play a very modest role. Now, a new hobby has started in the United States, which I really found very dangerous, is private ownership of prisons, giving prisons to be run like a private business. So for all those reasons, in addition to a high violent and otherwise criminality, the system of criminal justice in the United States, the procedure is still good. It gives rights to the citizens, although are being restricted. It is open. The commissions that you established are revealing. I mean, when Soviet Russia criticizes American systems, it criticizes on the basis of your own reports, <laughs> because the reports are so objective and so frank. We can't get their reports, but they have our reports and criticize us. There is a lot of publicity, a lot of openness. There is a lot of desire to raise it, but it is still very, very primitive. Sir Leon, when one reviews your list of publications, it becomes apparent that you do not normally do book reviews. But yet, you reviewed Ramsey Clark's Crime in America, an extensive review. Why did you agree to do that one? Well, it is true to say that I don't review books. You know, I, don't, I read books, but I don't review them, because fundamentally, you know, I am a man who has strong views on the subject. That's perfectly true, and I don't mind expressing them. But I was always reluctant really, to write a review and to criticize my colleagues. I know how difficult it is, you know, to write a good book, and who am I to pass those judgments? It's a different thing as we sit and talk together, you have your views and I, we share them. And I didn't like this reviewing and establish myself as a pope of criminology, saying certain things which may be true or may not be true. And I avoided it. I, I reviewed two books, as a matter of fact. One, I reviewed a book, I wish I could remember it. I was asked by the editor, by Goodhart, distinguished professor of American origin, low quarter review editor, published by two men <coughs> of German origin, one of them committed suicide, a very remarkable book on penal system and penitentiary things. I reviewed this. <coughs> now, I reviewed one or two others, but very little considering my length of my life and the amount of readings that I do. Now, how did it happen that I reviewed this one? I reviewed this one. I lived in Charlottesville. I was a distinguished professor there in Charlottesville, Virginia. And you know, it's a leisurely kind of place. So they don't ask you to work very hard. Indeed, if you go to a hairdresser, when he shaves, he gives you a cup of coffee. Everything is slowed down in Charlottesville, Virginia. So I had not much to do there. And at some stage, a distinguished friend of mine, who was the inter judge of the International Court, and he was one of the co editors of the journey, Virginia Quarterly, it was in the Virginia Quarterly Review, asked me whether I would like to review this book. I read the book and I was irritated by it. Because this book brought home to me all this unjustified optimism that one had, which was, which did damage criminology and others. Because doctors never say that they are going to solve the whole cancer. Doctors don't say those things. Mathematicians don't say that their form is perfect. Why should we promise those kind of things? It's part of the utopian optimism that we discussed at the beginning of the discussion. And I saw in Clark, at least in case of some of us, we could justify it by our young age. But Clark was a grown-up person. He should have known better, he's an intelligent man, and he wrote this book where he promised everything. There will be no crimes, there will be no this, nothing at all. Everything will be a paradise when the democratic ideals, you know, and equal, equalitarian society will establish themselves, which is not true. There would be crime, maybe a different kind of crime. And I was irritated by it, and the way in which he wrote, kind of, you know, I don't know whether you have read the book, as in a very self-centered kind of way, uh, writing it, and I thought I better have a go at him. And I took a lot of time. It was, as you say, an extensive review. I understand that he didn't like it very much. I'm not surprised. <laughs> and I think the book is really a flop because it has increased our illusions and has created the impression that liberal people can be flop, that they can think in loose terms, that they can be uneven. And this is very dangerous thing to possess in the field of criminology. Along the lines of theory, there's a recently published article, 1984 uh, article, that claims that there's been a demise of the criminological imagination. Do you share this view? And if so, to what do you attribute it? Well, I would say yes. 
there was a certain lack of imagination when they concentrated so much on the explanations of crime, because it ceased to be original. Look, the hundreds of articles. Roger Hood and I, we composed a bibliography of criminological literature, and it was published. We got a prize, I think, first prize for it. Okay. Now, the article is devoted by the Bibliographical Society of the United States. The article devoted to anony for us. Hundreds and hundreds of them. And it's the same story. This is why I call lack of imagination. If something is being repeated and repeated and repeated, it's lack of imagination. The same thing with deviancy. The same thing with labeling theory. The same thing with differential association. I have a great respect for Cressy. But, for instance, he adopted the Sutherland theory like if it had been the explanation of the human mankind by Darwin. It is a, it's a lack of imagination, lack of selectivity of mind to attach such a great importance to certain things and regard them as a key answer to a complex problem. There is less of it now. I'm glad to say there is less. But now they have a new hobby, the criminal penologist, is the question of sentencing. This becomes now a new hobby. For Americans can't live without concentrated hobbies, but not forever. They start this, they raise it, they pursue it with a concentration which is incredible, and then they drop it. And now, the sentencing <coughs> guidelines, this is the new hobby. Earlier in our conversation, mm -hmm. we t you touched on the political, rela the relationship between politics and criminology. Yeah. <laughs> And I'd like to read to you something that you said and, and, and have you comment on that. Mm -hmm. At one point you said, too often, though perhaps inevitably, criminology reflects the prevailing political ideology. Yes. Now, if you still adhere to this position, would you comment on where you think criminology is going given the current political climate in the United States? In the United States? Well, <coughs> you know, I have to be very careful what I say because I'm a, I, am, I am only a resident who has a permanent status. So if I don't behave myself, I don't know what you are going to do. I should be sent back to my old country, which will not be a crime, but I'm settled happily here, so I like to be careful what I say. And, however, I will say what I like to say. Well, we'll keep this between us. Oh, I, no, no, no. <laughs> I would make it public soon, too. Now, the point is, criminology, criminal justice reflects political ideology has always reflected, there's no question. And to deny it is ridiculous. Or to make a case against criminology because it is influenced. It's like saying, I don't wish to eat an omelette because you have to break the eggs. It is some of those criminologists who have this idea. You have to accept facts of life. Criminology is the way in criminal justice that we deal with people who commit crime or want to commit crime. We punish them in the way that we feel they ought to be punished. They are not, hardly ever do they agree to it. It is imposed on them by the predominant tenor of the society. The law is not that we have is not the law of the thieves, but it's the law of us who feel that we are the law-abiding citizens and we ought to impose on them. Society has changed, <coughs> therefore how can criminology and criminal justice be divorced from politics? It's nonsense. But it is question of degree. It's all that I can say. If I end of your attitude, what you really like, I will say that we have a liberal system of criminal justice in its classical form. You have a liberal social system, which is a combination of social approach and liberal. You have a conservative approach, and you have an authoritarian approach. Those are the ideologies, fundamentally. Some of us are liberals, some of us are conservatives, some of us are authoritarians, and some of us want to have mixed social and liberal. Now, what is best for criminology, from a selfish point of view? For criminology, the best ideology is the liberal social because it gives you scope for independent research, it gives you hopes, it gives you idealism, providing that it doesn't go too far. If they don't punish, if they are weak, if the disparity is very great, if they make mess, because remember, it's much more difficult to administer a liberal social system than an authoritarian. Much more difficult. Incomparably so. 
So if it is well administered, I would say this is the best, the most progressive system. But this is my point of view. Now the others say, look, crime has been increasing. You did very little, those of you who believed in liberal and social things. People don't like it. The census today says in the United States that 75% at least would be in favor of reintroduction capital punishment. Even the students who in the 1960s were against capital punishment, today majority of them are in favor of it. They say the trend of public opinion has changed and we <coughs> ought to change correspondingly. One day, a beautiful day in Paris, a very elegant hostess gave a party. And they were drinking champagne and there was a member of parliament present there too. The windows were open and the member of parliament saw a manifestation moving on the boulevard. So he said to the hostess, Madame la Comtesse, forgive me, I have to leave your party because I have to follow them. I am the leader. <laughs> and this is what <laughs> I think it's a delightful story. That when it comes to those problems, governments follow public opinion. When they don't have the stamina, the conviction to resist. And it's extremely difficult to resist pressure in the field of crime <coughs> because people are very sensitive to it. Thank you. We haven't talked about juvenile delinquency at all yet. No. And in that vein, I'd like to take a moment and read to you something yeah. that you wrote in one of your publications. Uh, you once compared juvenile delinquency to measles. You said, and I quote, as a rule, it takes a mild form. Only for a few is the infection virulent. The complications yeah. serious. The young are especially susceptible, but the likelihood is that they will make a good recovery and bear no scars. Do you elaborate on that? Yes. I think this is proved statistically that about the, the la big majority, large majority of young offenders stop. I don't know how many of them continue. I wouldn't say more than 10 or 15 percent continue, but about 80 percent stop committing crimes unless they are corrupted by the system of criminal justice. There are small offenses of the 80 percent. They are episodical. <clears throat> they are very often expression of adolescence. And if they are dealt adequately and effectively, I do not believe that they will fill the ranks of the habitual army. There will be a small contingent. And this contingent, I agree, is very active and very persistent and chronic. To shift gears for a moment. Yes, please. And to borrow from you. Why is it that a century of theorizing and research should have made little or no apparent impact upon the trends of crime in society or upon our ability to modify criminal tendencies? This is one of the questions that criminologists don't wish to be asked, you know. I accept it with great pleasure, this question. Because I believe that to expect that a discipline can change a state, a social fact, is asking for something which is impossible. A discipline can enlighten us about the dimensions, the substance of a social fact. Better to understand it, better to interpret it. It may, it may help us to change an attitude towards a social phenomenon, to be more enlightened, or to be more severe, or to be more tolerant. It may help us not to make big mistakes in penitentiary and correctional field. This criminology can do and has done. But to expect criminology to change the state of crime is unfair. Phenomenon of crime is a product of individuality and of society. It's a question which is deeply embedded in the structure of society. It depends on the moral cultural, ethical, political of society. It has its strengths to develop in accordance with the forces and with great events, for instance, like, like the war, like economic depression. No discipline can change it. This is the difference between criminology and medicine. Medicine could change the incident, the treatment of diabetes. Medicine could, I understand, deal effectively with certain aspects of cancer. Engineers can b build bridges, allow us therefore to cross rivers, but criminology, like, social, like sociology, cannot influence the development of society directly. They can only influence by the cultural, inquisitive, probing approach. 
This series is intended to serve a broad spectrum of the criminology community, including academics and professional practitioners. It is our sincere hope that presentations of this sort will contribute positively to our goal of realizing social justice in our complex and changing world. Toward this end, your comments, criticisms, and support are invited and appreciated. It must be remembered that a substantial, though not always productive, element of social debate has focused on disagreement over what was really meant by such historical giants as Durkheim, Marx, and Weber. It is only through the development of technology that oral histories such as this can capture directly the thoughts, words, and positions of the masters. This is Robert Muchnick thanking you for joining us.